The views and opinions expressed by contributors on the Spoon River Gothic podcast are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the host. Material heard on the Spoon River Gothic podcast is intended for adult listeners. This podcast deals with mature topics that may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. This is Spoon River Gothic, narrative of a double homicide. Chapter 37 The Forest for the Trees You know my method. It is founded upon the observation of trifles. Arthur Conan Doyle The Process of Investigation For the court to be satisfied that the investigator acted lawfully and within the bounds of the legally prescribed authority, the judge needs to hear the investigator describe their thinking process to form reasonable grounds. The distinction between investigative tasks and investigative thinking is to understand the investigation process, and it is necessary to comprehend the difference between investigative tasks and investigative thinking. Investigative tasks relate to the information gathering methods that feed into investigative thinking and the results. On the other hand, investigative thinking is the process of analyzing information and theorizing to develop investigative plans. Investigative tasks relate to identifying physical evidence, gathering information, evidence collection, evidence protection, witness interviewing, suspect interviewing, and interrogation. These essential tasks must be learned and practiced with a high degree of skill to feed the maximum amount of accurate information into the investigative thinking process. A criminal investigation aims to collect, validate, and preserve information supporting the investigative thinking process. Investigative thinking aims to analyze the information collected, develop theories of what happened, how an event occurred, and establish reasonable grounds to believe. Those reasonable grounds to believe will identify suspects and lead to arrest and charges. Investigative thinking is analyzing evidence and information, considering alternative possibilities to establish how an event occurred and determine if they are reasonable. The investigative process is a progression of activities or steps moving from evidence gathering tasks to information analysis, to theory development and validation, to forming reasonable ground to believe, and finally to arrest and charge a suspect. Knowing these steps can be helpful because criminal incidents are dynamic and unpredictable. In order which events occur and the way evidence and information become available for collection can also be unpredictable. Thus. Only flexible general rules to structured responses can be applied. However, specific steps must be followed no matter how events unfold and when the evidence and information are received. These include collection, analysis, theory development, and validation, suspect identification, forming reasonable grounds, and taking action to arrest, search, and lay charges. In any case, as unpredictable as criminal events may be, the results police investigators aim for are always the same, and one should always keep the desired results in mind to provide focus and priority to an overall investigative process, and a mental map is an appropriate metaphor to illustrate the investigative thinking process. In this process, even though the path one will take to investigate may be unclear and unpredictable at first, the destination, the results we seek in our investigation, will always be the same and can be expressed in terms of results and their priorities. Gathering and preserving evidence, accurately documenting the event, and establishing reasonable grounds to identify and arrest offenders. Sherlock Holmes walks into a dirty, dingy room that is sealed off with yellow police tape. Inside a woman is lying dead on the floor. Other British police detectives, who had examined the body before Sherlock Holmes arrived, conclude that the woman committed suicide based on their deductive reasoning. However, 
Holmes thinks otherwise, as Sherlock Holmes never uses deductive reasoning to assist him in solving a crime. Instead, he uses inductive reasoning. He observed the scene and noticed certain jewelry on the woman's body had been recently cleaned, except for her wedding ring. That forced him to ask the question, why? Why would she clean everything except her wedding ring? Holmes induced that the woman did not commit suicide, in part because she was traveling to London for one day. She packed an overnight bag and had a secret meeting before returning home. The meeting and wedding ring allowed Holmes to continue to probe the non-obvious, asking questions along the way, but never forming a final opinion. Sherlock Holmes behaves like an annoying child who continually asks why. The whys stack up upon one another, and before too long, they allow Holmes to form a pattern to reach a hypothesis, and then a final theory. British writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle created the character Sherlock Holmes to become the best detective in the world by seeing the nun obvious at every crime scene. Unlike most superheroes, Doyle did not equip Holmes with specialized capabilities, only the power of induction. We need to form a process of our own when observing situations, using the power of inductive reasoning. We must ask why more often. Stop jumping to false conclusions by collecting data, supporting our desired decisions that justify the actions taken. And in the case of the double homicide of Donna and Justine Tompkins, it is our task to investigate the investigation, not from a place where our forlorn conclusions upon setting out on this task abide, but from a space of neutrality, where we see the evidence before us as naked as the day appears before that child asking why. Why do investigators ask the questions they choose to ask? And equally, why do they not ask those from which they refrained? Was the investigation into the double homicide objective? Or at any particular stage in the inquiry, had certain suspects been railroaded? Which is to force and steer the investigation in a specific direction that has been led by preference, be it conscious or not. When something is forced to happen, or someone is forced to do something, quickly or unfairly, a deduction occurs. This investigation process has taken away an amount of integrity, and the subjective prevails, causing, in terms of a criminal investigation, someone to be sent to prison without a fair trial by employing false evidence. And if the court is nonetheless satisfied that the investigators acted lawfully enough and within the bounds of the legally prescribed authority or closely sufficient, and the judge hears the investigators describe their thinking process to form reasonable grounds or reasonable suspicion that justified the actions taken, this shall amount to judicial misconduct. In other words, corrupted justice. Equal treatment before the law is a pillar of democratic societies. When courts are corrupted by greed, or political expediency, prejudice, or what have you, the scales of justice are tipped, and ordinary people suffer. Judicial corruption means the voice of the innocent goes unheard, while the guilty act with impunity. Corruption is not a coincidence. Corruption is a child of motive. But what are the motivation of the corrupt to corrupt? Money? Sex? Revenge? But what of peer pressure, prejudice, power? And what of vigilante justice? Can such occur even in a court of law? Can judge become hangman when the desire to express the recognition of harm, the damage, the victimhood, and the violence which had resulted of the crime outweighs a sworn duty to prevent the personal and communal psychological defense mechanism? of the denial by projecting responsibility and blame onto an innocent scapegoat, the court allowing the community to eliminate any negative feelings about itself for expressing anger by furthering violence, by stringing up the wrong man to provide that longing for a sense of gratification. As men and women of the jury, it is your duty to examine the investigation to ensure this had not occurred irrespective of prejudice, free of subjective deduction, to walk into the interview room with the detectives and those questioned like Mr. Holmes, 
with a sense of inductive reasoning to observe the process and like a curious child ask that question, why? To spot the non-obvious and ask why, why? And allow those whys to stack upon one another and before long they shall allow us to form a pattern to reach a hypothesis and then, alas, a final theory. As investigators resume the investigation into the deaths of Donna and Justine, Illinois State Police Special Agent Kenneth Kedzer began his rounds of interviews on March 30th, 1993, by making a stop at Wareco Gas Station in Canton, Illinois, to speak with employee Sue Ann Harris. Sue Ann told the agent she had worked there for the last five years and was currently the assistant manager. She said she worked the night of January the 12th, 1993, the night before the fire at the Tompkins residence until 10 p.m. and that the station would have remained closed until 4 a.m. the following morning when the manager, Jeff Bennett, would have arrived. But Sue Ann stated she did not know Donnie Bull. Agent Kedzer then traveled across town to the Adams 66 service station where he spoke with the owner, Willard Adams. Agent Kedzer asked Mr. Adams if he had repaired a tire for Donnie on January 13th, but Mr. Adams said that he did not know Donnie Bull and that he did not usually give receipts for tire repairs and therefore could not tell who may have had a tire repaired that day. He suggested the agent speak with another employee, Walt Edwards, who would have been working that morning. Mr. Adams called in Walter Edwards from the shop, and Agent Kedzer showed Walter a photograph of Donnie Bull. Walter recognized Donnie and said that he occasionally uses the station, but that he did not recall if he had repaired a tire for Donnie that morning, and that he did not remember repairing a tire for anyone that day. Special Agent Kedzer made his way back across to the east side of town to Twins Liquor, where it was said Donnie had purchased beer the night of his card game at the home Donnie shared with his girlfriend, Rochelle Hillmeyer, on January the 12th. Agent Kedzer spoke with Larry Bowler, who said he knew Donnie, and that he came into the liquor store quite often, usually to purchase Bud or Bud Light beer. He stated that on January 12th, he and John Robbins were working, and that he was probably stalking that night, and John was working the register. And lastly, he said Donnie could have been in on the 12th, but was unsure. Special Agent Kedzer returned a few hours later to speak with Richard Heron, who said he usually worked on Friday and Saturday evenings between 4.30 p.m. and 12 midnight. He said that his duties consisted of giving beer and liquor to customers at the counter and drive up window and stocking shelves, and that another employee he worked with was responsible for handling the cash and running the register. Richard also told Agent Kedzer that he was familiar with Donnie Bull, because he and Donnie were in fact first cousins. He said that Donnie purchased beer from them at the liquor store all the time, and that Donnie was usually in at least once a weekend, and that Donnie bought several different brands of beer, but none of which type he could recall. He said the store was usually busy on Friday and Saturday nights, and that he had not really paid any attention to what Donnie had purchased in the past. He stated that Donnie had purchased liquor from the store, numerous times when accompanied by different individuals, and then he knew Donnie would buy Michelob beer when it was on sale, long neck bottles for $12 even. Richard said that he could not recall if Donnie had bought any beer the night of the 12th, and Agent Kedzer learned but little more from the interview. The following day, Special Agent Kedzer met with John Robbins at his residence in Canton, and John said that he had previously worked at Twins Liquors, and worked Mondays from 8 a.m. until 4, and Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 4.30 until 11, and Saturdays from 4.30 to midnight. Agent Kedzer showed John a photograph of Donnie Bull, and John immediately recognized Donnie, stating that Donnie had been in Twins many times. He said that Donnie bought beer at the store at least three times a week, and that Donnie usually bought Budweiser, and was often with another white male with a beard. Agent Kedzer asked Mike if he was also related to Donnie, and he said that no, he was not. 
and when asked if he recalled Donnie buying beer on the evening of the 12th, he said that he could not remember. And again, the agent left with little. Returning to Twins Liquors, he again spoke with Larry Bowler, who stated that he and his wife owned the store, a small wooden building with a drive through on 5th Avenue on the south side of Canton. He said he usually works every day at the store except Fridays and Saturdays, and again said he was familiar with Donnie Bull. In fact, he said, he and Donnie were first cousins, and he elaborated by saying that his mother and Donnie's were sisters. Mr. Bowler said Donnie did frequent the store to buy beer, and that David Nell often accompanied him, and that to his knowledge, David and Donnie were good buddies, and they had been for years. He also stated that he was aware that Donnie had been living with Rochelle Hillmeyer, and that she too often frequented the store and had been in the store with Donnie in the past. He added that Donnie always entered the store and never used the drive-up window. Mr. Bowler recalled that Donnie often purchased Michelob long neck bottles, and almost always when it was on sale, $12 even. He said he had it on sale twice a year in 1993, and he speculated that he may have had Michelob on sale sometime during the month of January. He also told Agent Kedzer that he ran ads for the sale price every Tuesday in the Canton Daily Ledger paper, $12 even a case, and that Donnie probably purchased at least a case each day when it was on sale. In closing, Agent Kedzer learned from Mr. Boyle that he had never given Donnie a special discount in Michelob or any other of his family members, but no additional information was obtained. March 2nd, Special Agent Kedzer interviewed Ronald Long at Canton Police Department. Ronald advised the agent that he was the manager of the apartment located at 3rd and Locust in Canton, where Donnie had rented apartment C, and when asked, Ronald said that to his knowledge, Donnie did not have a phone at the time, and probably neither did now. Ronald also stated that Donnie still owed him $300 in rent and damages, saying that Donnie had only paid half a month rent on August 28, 1992 and that while Donnie was living there, he had broken down the door to the apartment. Ronald said that since Donnie owed him back rent and the money to repair the door, he kicked him out during the first week of January 1993, and that Donnie had removed all his belongings after he was evicted. Special Agent Kedger also spoke with Donnie's ex-wife, Leela Bull, at the Canton Police Department. Leela stated that she was married to Donnie in February of 81, and that she had obtained a divorce from him in 86. She characterized her marriage to Donnie as being rocky, especially when Donnie was drinking or high on drugs. Leela recalled that in June or July of 81, Donnie had given her a severe beating, which left her profoundly battered and bruised. Leela added that it was so bad she required treatment at Graham Hospital Emergency Room, but that when asked, she could not recall what the beating was over, that two or three days after the event, Donnie completely forgot about it, that Donnie could not believe it had occurred, and acted like he did not remember anything about it. Leela also told the agent that Donnie had a bad temper, and that it didn't take anything to set him off. She said that Donnie on occasion would just go crazy and act extremely irrational, elaborating, he ain't got no visitation rights to see the boys. She said that she would not let Donnie take their children anywhere or visit them under any circumstances. I don't let him anywhere near them, she said, and that she was still scared to death of him. She stated that she felt Donnie was undoubtedly capable of murder and violence, saying, especially if he is in one of his drunk and crazy states of mind. Leela said that Donnie's best friend was David Nell and that David and Donnie had been friends for years, stating, they're always running around together, getting into trouble. And that if Donnie was ever in trouble, Donnie would go to David for help, confirming, yeah, David would lie for Donnie if he had to. Leela said that her son goes to school with one of Rochelle's daughters, and that shortly after the fire, 
Rochelle's daughter displayed a necklace and ring at school that Donnie had given her. But she did not know where Donnie would have acquired it, saying, He ain't got no money to be buying anything like that. Adding that giving gifts was entirely out of character for Donnie. Meanwhile, Canton Police Sergeant and Lead Detective on the case, Sergeant David Ayers, spoke with Donnie's sister, Sherry Spangler, on the phone. Sherry told the sergeant that she does not see Donnie very often, and that she never had a couch stored for him, and that she was completely unaware of any couch of Donnie's that had been at any of her sister's houses either. But she did state that the couch Donnie had sold Donna was their mother's, and that it was given to Donnie after her death by their sister Sheila Ogle, who lived in Bushnell, Illinois. Let me pause, ladies and gentlemen, and point out a peculiarity that stands out to me as well. Peculiar. The fact that Donna and her three-year-old daughter Justine were both found murdered on a couch that Donnie had inherited from his mother after she had passed away. A man said to have become irreconcilably distraught and in a behavioral downhill spiral since her death, who had sold Donna said couch and delivered it to Donna's new apartment on Halloween of 1992 on the second anniversary of the death of Donnie's mother, who had indeed passed away on Halloween of 1990, while Donna herself was irreconcilably mourning the death of her own mother, which had led to Donna to leave her abusive husband John and seek a new life, suddenly and frightfully aware that life is too short to live a life you don't want to live. But jury, make your own conclusions as to the oddity of this synchronicity. Whether it be that, in fact, or a mere coincidence with rather connective principles that make my own hair on the back of my neck rise. Or if it had been a sort of curious, though possibly subconscious motivation for violence and lashing out at the unjustness of life, and thus death, mourning by murder per se. Next, Special Agent Kedzer thought it might be a good idea to follow up with Iona Price's husband and Donnie's longtime friend and co-worker, Mike Price, who was currently incarcerated at the Fulton County Jail for an unknown offense. Mike told the agent that he first met Donnie sometime in the summer of 1992. At the time, he said, Donnie was living with Ronnie Henderson on North 10th Avenue in Canton. Mike further stated that at this time, Donnie was working at Excel Meat Packaging Plant in Beardstown, Illinois, but he recalled Donnie had been injured in some type of accident at the plant and either quit or was laid off due to the injury. Mike said he had helped Donnie get hired at Wright's Furniture in Canton. Mike said that he had been working there for around four years and that Donnie started working there at the furniture store in the late summer or early fall of 92 and that Wright's pays minimum wage. Mike also stated that Donnie occasionally got mouthy and irritated when drunk and when asked by Agent Kedzer, but that Donnie was never a real problem. He said that on one or two occasions he had been to the Bull Hillmeyer residence on South 2nd Avenue in Canton to attend a party on a Friday evening. Mike added that he does not stay out late and party when he must get up and go to work the following day. He recalled that he, David Nell, Rochelle Hillmeyer, Jeff Ashley, Shelley Brooks, and Donnie Bull had been present playing cards the last time he had been there at the house. He said that they had been drinking beer, talking, and possibly playing cards, that they had also been drinking Michelob beer, which Donnie purchased the Twins Liquors, or Eastside Liquors, in Canton. According to Mike, Donnie may have a cousin who drives a Volkswagen van and works at Twins. Mike also stated that sometime during the evening he had been at Donnie and Rochelle's, that Rochelle's daughter returned home with her boyfriend, who lived in Smithfield, Illinois. He said that sometime before 11 p.m., they left the party and drove to his and Iona's house, recalling that Donnie and the others hung out, drank more beer, and then left. When asked by Agent Kedzer, Mike said no, Donnie didn't show up for work on January 13th, the morning of the fire. 
He stated that it was not unusual for Donnie to miss work if he had been out drinking heavily the night before. Mike also said Donnie did not show up for work on Thursday, January the 14th, the following day, advising the agent that when Donnie finally returned to work, he had been talking to the owner of the store about the fire at the Tompkins residence, and that when Donnie asked what the two were talking about and what Mike told him, Donnie acted like he didn't know anything about the fire or the deaths of Donna and Justine Tompkins. Mike also told Agent Kedzer that he was fully aware that Donnie and Donna knew one another, stating that the two had met at a barbecue roundup restaurant in Canton. According to Mike, once visited each other at his and Iona's home after meeting at the restaurant. He added that he was also aware that Donnie had sold Donna a couch, and that Donnie had told him that day that he delivered the sofa, that he had taken the money, which had been wrapped around a key for the apartment in the mailbox at her home. Mike said that he knew that Donna had tried calling Donnie at the furniture store from Connecticut over Christmas, but that he did not know why she was trying to get in touch with him. But Mike theorized that perhaps Donnie was trying to sell Donna another piece of furniture, elaborating that Donnie was constantly trying to sell things to raise money for beer and what have you. Mike told the agent that he was aware Donnie found Donna attractive, stating that on more than one occasion, Donnie told him that he would like to have sex with Donna, and that several times after the fire, he had asked Donnie if he was responsible for the fire and her death. However, Donnie told him that he was not. Mike added that he knew Donnie had told him in the past that he had been arrested for raping his then ex-wife, and that made him suspicious. Mike said that at around a week before Donnie's latest arrest, he had gotten a flat tire on Rochelle's car, and that Donnie had the tire repaired at the Adam 66 station, located on West Locust Street. According to Mike, Donnie also bought some new tires at the same station. In closing, Mike said he recalled that Donnie had not showed up for work the day after the woman was raped in Hewlett Park, south of Canton, and the agent scribbled fiercely in his notepad these commonalities of absence. The following day, Special Agent Kedzer teamed up with Sergeant Ayers to speak with a Bruce Nell in the interview room at Canton Police Department. Bruce told the agents that several weeks after the fire at Donna's apartment, his girlfriend's daughter, April Owens, was told by Shauna Nell that Shauna overheard David Nell and Vicky Nell talking about the fire, stating that April told him that she heard Shauna heard David say that Donnie had done it. Bruce stated that his brother Tom Nell married Vicky Nell, and Shauna is Tom and Vicky's daughter, adding that David Nell made the statement about Donnie Bowles at Tom Nell's house. How is that for a tongue twister of a product of the rumor mill, as such is often the case with criminal investigations? As Agent Kedzer worked out the equation on his pad, Bruce went on to state that Donnie had lived at Bruce's parents' house for about six months, around a year ago, and that Donnie is a very mannerly guy around other people's parents, but that he isn't really that way on his own, adding that Donnie is a very convincing and clever liar. And with this, the interview concluded, and the officers spoke amongst themselves, working to untangle the mix of names, statements, and events. But one thing that stood out loud and clear was that final statement. Donnie was a liar and a damn good one at that. Next, Agent Kedzer traveled to the residence of Tanya Lee Davis. Tanya told the agent that she was familiar with Donnie Bull, stating that she knew Donnie through his ex-wife, Leela, whom she was friends with. She said that on or near Christmas of 92, she and her sister, who was visiting from the state of Montana, attended a party at the Sherry Spangler residence. Sherry was Donnie Bull's sister, she said, adding that her sister had met Donnie at the party and that he had flirted with her all night long. 
Tanya also mentioned that her sister had visited Canton in late January or early February as well, in that current year of 1993. According to Tanya, she and her sister had been drinking at Brew and Q Tavern in Canton, and Donnie and Dave Anell had also been there. According to Tanya, Donnie again began to flirt with her sister, attempting to pick her up. Tanya said that her sister had rebuffed Donnie's attempts, and that they soon left the tavern and returned to her home. She added that upon arrival at home, she and her sister changed into their pajamas and got ready to go to bed for the evening. Tanya said that she had gone to the back door to let her dog out and spotted someone run around to the side of the house, and that she was sure it was Donnie Bull. I knew it was him, she said, and that she walked around to the side of the house and confronted Donnie. She added that she told Donnie to get the hell out of here, but that Donnie said he would leave if she gave him a beer. She told the agent that she went back into the house, grabbed a can of beer from the fridge, and brought it back to Donnie, who waited outside. I told him to beat it, she said and that she believed Donnie then took off. Tanya said that this had frightened her, stating, it scared the shit out of me, and that for a period of time, she slept with a ball bat near her bed and with the phone in reach, so she could call the police if Donnie attempted to break into the house. She said she fears Donnie, and knows of problems Leela Bull, Jill Gray, and other women had experienced with him. He's batshit crazy, she said, and that she was not at all surprised when she heard that Donnie had recently been arrested for the assault on another woman at Hewlett Park. In closing, when asked, Tanya said that she had never heard Donnie talk about Donna or the fire. Special Agent Kedzer drove to the Price residence to follow up with Iona yet once again. Iona restated that she knew Donna well and that they had worked together at the Elks and that yes, she is undoubtedly familiar with Donnie Bull. Iona elaborated by stating that Donnie and her husband Mike also worked together at Wright's Furniture. Then changing the subject back to Donna, Iona stated that she believed Donna was naive and over-trusting in some ways. Still in other ways, Donna was very worldly, more so than most around Canton, but she was very secretive about her life. As an example when asked, Iona said that many people did not know that Donna smoked or drank hard liquor, but that in fact, Donna would frequently drink Canadian Mist and Coke while working at the Elks Club. Iona cited that Donna lived a double life, and that she would drink Miller Lite during her shifts at the Elks, and that she had been dating multiple men simultaneously, including several married men. Iona added that, to her knowledge, that Donna had never dated Donnie, or in the least that Donna had never told her that she dated Donnie, but that it was possible, she supposed. And that, to her knowledge, Donnie and Donna first met at Barbecue Roundup in Canton. She said that Donnie and Donna had been staring at each other, and that she knew Donna had a crush on Donnie. Iona elaborated, stating that Donna told her she was attracted to Donnie. He was a good-looking man, she stated but said she had warned Donna to never let Donnie into her house if she was there alone, stating that her husband Mike had told her that Donnie had made several comments about Donna being hot, sexy, attractive, stating that these comments, or so she assumed, had been made while Mike and Donnie were working together, moving furniture. Iona told the agent that she was aware that Donnie sold her the couch, and that Donnie had used her key to enter the apartment, but that she was unaware if Donnie had returned the key or not, stating, when asked, as she seemed to remember that Donna told her that she had already paid Donnie for the couch. Iona said that she was also aware that Donna had called Wrights looking for Donnie while she was away visiting family in Connecticut over Christmas, and that to her knowledge, the call was in reference to a Lazy Boy chair Donnie had promised her for Christmas. But Iona could not recall who had told her about the call, but stated that Donna had told her that she had not had a good visit with her father in Connecticut. According to Iona, Donna's father was upset with her because she didn't have a decent job or a serious relationship with a man. Agent Kedzer made his way back to the department to speak with Kimberly Ann Finley, who waited in the interview room with Sergeant David Ayers. Kimberly stated that she had dated Donnie Bull last summer and that they had sex a few times. 
adding that having sex with Donnie, he was all over me, she said, but that he was not rough with her and that he never hurt her. Kimberly also said that they would have sex at Ron Henderson's house on 10th Avenue in Canton. She said that about two months ago, Donnie came over to her house and said that the police thought that he had killed a lady in a fire. And she stated that within the last month, she went out cruising and drinking on country roads with Donnie, and that Donnie once tried to sell her a silver Black Hills gold ring about a year ago. She said that at the time, Donnie had a bunch of stuff like that at his sister's house, Sherry Spangler, that he kept in her basement. She added that Donnie never told me if he was involved in the lady's death or the fire, and no further information was acquired. Agent Kedzer got back in his car and then drove over to the house of Vicky Nell, where Vicky stated that David Nell was her brother-in-law. She said that she is only familiar with Donnie through her friendship with her brother-in-law, but Vicky told Agent Kedzer that she does not have a good or healthy relationship with David and that David had beaten her up during a family squabble on more than one occasion. She added that the last time this had occurred was around a year ago, when she had to go to the police and file a report about the assault. Vicky also said that she had never heard any information about the Tompkins fire from David, and she described her relationship with David as being cold, stating David would not be the one to confide with her about that type of information. Sean and Nell then entered the room, and she spoke with Agent Kedzer, saying that her mother was a sister-in-law of David Nell, and that she was in no way, well in her words, I'm not friends with Dave, or any of his friends or associates. She added that she had not spoken to David in over two months, but that, yes, she is familiar with Donnie Bull and his children. She said that she knows him through David, but that she knows him and his children only socially, and that they had not heard a word about Donald Tompkins, nor the fire from David or Donnie, but that, hell no, I would not lie for Dave. He is nothing to me. A few days later, Special Agent Kedzer made his way to the home of Leanne Walters for a follow-up interview. Leanne stated that beginning in September of 92, a subject, whom she later identified as Donnie Bull, would follow her. She said that Donnie would wait in the median of Locust Street near 3rd Avenue on his bicycle, and that when she drove home from work past that location, she stated, Donnie would follow me on his bike, pedaling as fast as he could, trying to figure out where I lived. She said that Donnie would then ride past her house daily and that when she would sit on her front porch, Donnie would stand on the corner and watch her. She told the agent that Donnie once came to her house, and her boyfriend answered the door. That Donnie asked for her, but her boyfriend said that she was not there at the time. And Donnie said, tell her Donnie Bull was here. She will know why. Leanne said Donnie continued harassing her until the end of 1992, and that she speculated Donnie was harassing her because she was friends with Jill Welker, and Jill would come over often. Jill was scared shitless of Donnie, she said. He can't take his eyes off of her. Ladies and gentlemen, a statement such as this can be priceless to an investigation. But can they not also prejudice the investigation? And in the process of gathering evidence and statements, how can the fine line be maintained between the two? The character profile is of umpteenth value when evaluating potential suspects. Still, is not hearsay or even derogatory statements of fact potentially nourishing the unconscious bias to judge and therefore prejudice, which in turn might lead to deductive reasoning, leading oneself as the investigator to pursue a preferred outcome? to shape an investigation to fit a prejudice that has, knowingly or not, formed within the moral chambers of one's mind? And if so, how can this tightrope be transversed without falling off into the realm of railroading, or even corruption? How can criminal profiling and an unescapable, unconscious bias walk hand in hand from one end of an investigation to the other without canceling each other out. He is a bad guy, so he must have done it. But are there not umpteenth wayward players in this world, in this investigation alone? Or does it come down to who is worse on a scale of morality? Or shall only the worst of the worst commit unthinkable deeds? 
what constitutes and justifies railroading? Bad enough? Worse than the others? And when does this moral bias lead an investigation astray? When tunnel vision formulates, concentrates, and sharpens in on one preferable suspect? And then what? What happens with such? Well, all other potential suspects shall fall away to the blind spots, to the space where multitasking begins to simplify, minimize, and or simply neglect or forget. Forget who? Dave? Terry? John? Rod? Rod who? And what of the umpteenth others? You sought and stalked and swarmed about, hovering for a chance, lying in wait, circling about and craving, watching, following. And what of those others that could not take their wandering eyes off of Donna? What eyes had blinked, turned away, and disappeared into the blind spot? And why had they? Why, asked Sherlock Holmes. Why stop looking? Why lose periphery when the room is large? And what happens when we fixate on one subject alone? It's one thing not to see the forest for the trees, but then to go on and deny the reality of the forest is a more serious matter. And what does Sir Arthur Conan Doyle have to say on this matter? There's nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact. Donnie loved his beer and his women. I'm Corey Zimmerman, and this is Spoon River Gothic. Gothic is a production of Longbird Media in association with CZ Studio and Radio Verite. The show is produced by August Olson, editing, directing, and producing by Corey Zimmerman, audio mastering and engineering by E. Mastered. Research is done by Anne Marie Cannon, Chelsea Mesa, and me, Jinra Illustrisimo. Spoon River Gothic is written and hosted by Corey Zimmerman. You can follow the show at czstudio.works and read the blog at spoonrivergothic.com. Show some love by leaving us a rating or a review on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And stay tuned for the next episode as we dive deeper into the Donald Bull case. Thank you for listening. This is Spoon River Gothic, narrative of a double homicide.